Hey, welcome back to Living Beyond Sunday. This is a podcast where we talk about the everyday Christian life. I'm back here with Pastor Mike. My name is Jonathan Sams. Pastor Mike, we've got kind of an interesting, fun one. We did it uh, about a month ago. We did a listener question one where we just rapid fire questions. And so we've got another backlog of questions that uh, we're going to go through today, starting with um, the question from a listener. And she says, hey, I know I need to understand the Bible in context, but I'm understanding it's to be able to really get the meaning out of it. But like, how do I do that? What's, is there a structure or a system that I can use to be able to, to do that and understand the Bible for, for all it's worth? Yeah. First of all, I just want to affirm the the question. I mean, I think it's a great question to be able to ask to say, man, I care about knowing God's word. I understand it's written in a specific context. And so how do I navigate that context? And so I, I really, I wish more Christians were asking that question and cared about diving into the nuts and bolts of what that actually looks like. Uh, but that said, I think there's a couple of good resources I would point to. I think one's kind of an internal resource, I would call it, that's just sort of a framework for a personal level of reading God's Word. And then I want to talk about like an actual tool that you can use as well. Um, one of the things is just a really healthy healthy framework to be able to use when you're reading the Bible is um, OIA, which is really helpful. It's so you observe, you interpret, and you apply. And so when you observe, you're looking at like, okay, what what is the context? Are there repeated words or phrases? Who is he right? Who's the person writing to? Who is it about? You know, who's writing it? You're able to kind of it, it forces you to have this moment where you're in observation mode of going like, what exists here? You know, what's going on in the text? Um, then from there you interpret it. So what was the original intent of the author as they wrote it? And you're like, okay, you know, he's writing to this people for this purpose. Here's what this means. And then application in light of that, what does this now mean for for my life? And so on, on a personal scale, I would say that's really really helpful. That OI a model. Um, as far as tools that help you get in the observation mode, that you're like, man, how do I even learn more context about what's going on? I would point to the Gospel Coalition has free commentary resources. Yeah, those are great. Throughout books of the Bible that are really, really good. I use those as well. Sometimes I want to look up something quick. Um, it just does a really good job. It's very simple. It's not too like thick and uh, I can't weed through this. It's really helpful. Uh, and it's so free. It is free. It's yeah. free. Yep. Gospel Coalition. Uh, dot, is it org? TGC dot org, org, I think, yeah. or dot com. If you Google TGC commentaries, they'll, they'll pop, pop right up. up. Yeah. yeah, and then you go on, there's a tab, and you can actually go to, they've got courses, which is also helpful Yeah, uh, if you want to dive really into it. The last thing I would say is get a really good study Bible. I, I like the, the CSB study Bible. ESV also has a really good study Bible. Yep. Both of them have an online platform as well that help you uh, dive more into that um, so that you can have context and clarity around what you're reading. They'll have footnotes at the bottom, so you'll read something and be like, what, what is this talking about? And you can go down and read like a little you know, three sentence summary that helps get your mind around it. And the beginning of every, uh, every uh, book of the Bible, they do a summary of like location and themes and who's writing and who they write to, all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, if I could add one thing, I think it's also a plug to not study your Bible alone. Yeah. Like do it with other people, ask your questions, you know, get, get a couple of people around you and say, Hey, I want to go through the book of John, or I want to go through the book of first Corinthians, whatever it is. And within that, ask the question like, Hey, how do you all parse out this context here? And I think it's a, a, a plug that, you know, we should be helping each other do this and that it's not something that's elitist or like that someone's going to look down on someone for not understanding. It's, it's just a, we're here as a family to try to understand this together. So we should work together. Yeah. Uh, but I do think study Bible hundred percent. Super no doubt. helpful. Well, and that brings us kind of to the road where it normally leads is be a part of a healthy local church too. Yeah. Um, if, if you're a part of a healthy local church and the word is taught in its context, you'll start to learn context cues and clues, and it'll help you pick up on that. It'll also give you a framework as, you, as books of the Bible are taught. Hey, here's what's going on. Here, here's what this looks like. So then when you go have your time in the Word and you're in that book of the Bible, it's like, I got some clarity on this as well. Local church matters. Yeah, and the, the other thing is that, I mean, I'm, it's kind of implied in all of this, is studying the Bible is hard work, right? Like, it's a, it's a task to be done. Um, but it should be fruitful when it comes to giving us life. And, um, I mean, Jesus described bread of life, like the word does give us life, but it is work to be able to yeah. do this, to understand the context. But as with any skill or work or job, the more you do it, the better you get at it. Well, and the more you get from it too, right? Cause here's right. the problem when you don't read the Bible in its context, what you get is navel gazing where you're like, here's what I think it means. And here's what it means to me. And you know, yeah. and that stuff's actually hurtful. Yeah. And so you got a lot of people that have been hurt by Christianity where it's like, well, I thought this and God's word said this and this happened. And it's like, no, you just, you didn't read it right. I mean, goodness. I mean, Romans eight twenty eight, right? Like that has one been, of my favorite verses, man, one of my favorites in context, in right? context yeah, um, yeah. which is you got to read verse 29 and right. understand what Paul's saying in all of chapter eight. But you know, it's just important because that Jeremiah twenty nine eleven, you know, yep. has been taken out of context. And Philippians four thirteen, we could go on and on. And those, it, what's what's actually happened is people have not benefited from the intent of the text, 
And there's some beautiful nuggets of truth in there. But they've swung and missed on it because they've like, well, this is what I think it means. Or the worst is when like, I mean, this is what I think it means for me. And you're like, ah, oh, man, like that's tough. Because it just, it's very like, you're, you're looking at it through the lens of like self. Yeah. Um, the other scary thing is when people put themselves in the text. Right. Right. You know, not understanding that's where context is big. They put themselves in the text and it's like, no, you, when you're reading scripture, you're reading one author to one audience and you're on the outside looking in. You're not behind one or the other. Yeah. And so it's really important. And that, but again, we could go down that road for a long way, but I, I think it's important, like you're saying, context matters. And ultimately you're going to gain so much from understanding the context of which the Bible's written. Yeah. And I think that um, when it comes to, I think the questions that come up that this listener was implying, like she knows the right questions to ask. It's like, where, what, what is the structure and where do I go to answer them? So just to circle back, TGC for commentaries, um, got questions can be a helpful site uh, to just get some quick kind of biblical framework on some questions that you might have and then doing it together in a local church as well. Um, I'll just make a last plug here. Um, at least here at image church, we, we have an institute, we have the ability to offer what we would do hermeneutics classes if that's something that uh, a person would be interested in. Hermeneutics is just a fancy word for studying how to interpret the Bible. And so uh, for anyone listening that's curious about this, Googling hermeneutic principles is yeah. a way to approach that, that well, question. One other I'd add, add in there too is uh, Desiring God is really helpful. Yeah. If you go to their search queue and type in a question or he also does like look at the book. Yeah, where he goes really line helpful. by line and yeah. starts talking about how it's to do deep. it. It's deep. I mean, you got to really the, jump into the deep end of the pool, but but it's really good. Yeah, that's really good. Well, thank you for, for that. Yeah. Next question is um, on something that may be a little uncomfortable, but uh, it, it was asked and that is um, what are demons – and do they really have an effect on us today at the most basic level? Like we're not going to go super in depth, but yeah, because we could spend, <laughs> we, we could spend a, five podcasts yeah, on we it. Could, right. And we, maybe we will, yeah. but, uh, but when it comes to just kind of basic understanding, what, what are demons and, and how do they affect us today or, yeah. or do they? At their core, they're, they're fallen angels. And when you go back to the beginning, you look at Genesis and you see, um, that they are the angels that are fallen and they, they fell along with Lucifer, Satan, um, who was a very, um, prominent angel who decided to, um, rebel against God. And when he rebelled, turned his back, I want to be like God. I don't, you know, I want to do my own thing. Uh, a third of the angels fell with him. And so anything that we see demonic, um, it comes from that specific place in that time where that happened. Yeah, that's good. So let's talk about this just for a couple minutes. And like you said, we could do a whole mini podcast episodes on spiritual warfare, but when it comes to the demonic today, cause I think we live in America, People are under, they're almost like spiritual in one sense, but under spiritual in another. Um, and so when people are going, well, what, what does that mean for me today? What would you say to that person? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a couple of places to take this. There's, there's a Christian perspective and a non-Christian perspective of the impact that it has. And so I just quickly hit both of those. Um, and from what we understand from a uh, non-Christian impact is that um, Satan is the ruler of this world. He is the lowercase God of this world who have who has been for such a time as this been given jurisdiction um, over over the world and the brokenness that that's here and all that stuff. He 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 just preys on that. And so and you can even look at you know Ephesians two when it's like you know people that are not in Christ are walking underneath uh, the spirit of the air, the the spirit that's not working, the sons that are disobedient. Yeah. And so it's talking about non Christians that are under the jurisdiction of Satan. So so at that point it's fair game. Like they can have any impact, any influence. Um, it, it's a really, I mean, to be honest, it's a scary place to be because there is, it's a free for all in that space. Now, moving to the Christian, for those that are in Christ, it's, it's a different ball game. Um, because what we see in God's word is that he was in us is greater than he was in the world in first John. And so, you know, one of the things that we can walk away with is knowing that, uh, the enemy, Satan, demons, any of that stuff, uh, cannot fully take over your body, cannot fully, you know, uh, make you to where you're you're possessed. Um, but here's what the enemy can do, and this is where the, the call of vigilance for Christians is important. Is that if you think about your house, or your, your, you think about your life like a house, and in a house you have different rooms, right? In your life you have you have different rooms of of your life. Any area of your life, any room of your life um, that's not surrendered to the lordship of Christ is is fair game, and a lot of times for the enemy. That's where the enemy will prey on. And so when you think about sexual addiction. Right when you think about um, uh, you know um, 
there's lots of other examples that we could give pornography you could give a greed pride all these areas any area that's not fully surrendered to Christ that, that Christ is not reigning over in your life that you're saying you know think about like um, back to the home analogy it's like well I'll give God these rooms but like this one room is kind of that's my struggle zone or the place I'm not giving up that's the place where the enemy can have a foothold in your life and those are the areas that we've got to be diligent of to say man we don't want the enemy to have access to any parts of our house our, our lives our soul and so the way we do that is by constantly examining our hearts and saying, where are the places that we've not surrendered to Christ? What are the perpetual sins in our life? And then we drag those into the light. And when we expose those things in the light, we shine the gospel on those things. That's what expels um, the access of, of the enemy. And realizing that we have the power of Jesus to say no and to reject the enemy in that, in that way. So it is a different ballgame for Christians. But knowing that, that anything is a Christ follower too that happens in the demonic or spiritual realm, it happens underneath the sovereignty of God. And we see that with Job, right? Like when, when the, those that are the Lord's, nobody can take um, uh, Christians out of Jesus' hand. And so anything that happens to Christians happens underneath the sovereignty of the Lord. And so that's where my confidence is, of knowing yeah. that any of that kind of thing that happens happens under the sovereignty of the Lord, and I can trust his sovereign hand. Yeah, just to give a little, uh, another kind of verse back up, I think it's James 4, uh, where it says, uh, res- resist the devil and he will flee. But even right before that, it, he says, submit to God, resist the devil and flee. Like there's this idea that, resisting the devil means you're submitting to God. Like mm-hmm. that is how you resist is to submit to God in all areas of your life. Um, when it comes to kind of this idea of the room analogy, it kind of goes against what I was taught growing up. I mean, I agree with you now, but taught growing up is kind of like, Oh, if you're a Christian, you're good. You're safe. They, they can't touch you at all. Can't really affect you. If you're not, then, you know, fair game. But there is this idea that D- the d- demons and the demonic could have a potential effect if we're not surrendering all areas of our lives to Jesus, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you look at the, the in First John it talks about the spirit of the Antichrist, and I taught, taught through First John not long ago, and what we see is that it's it's active, most active through deception, and so when we fall prey to deception, we're falling prey to. Um, the spirit of the Antichrist, really, um, which is the spirit of deception. And so that's where we see that kind of access. It's not this full-on possession, but it is, it's it's holes in our life that the enemy worms its way in on and breathes lies into us. And so when you look at this idea of like the 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 lies and man, you know, First John talks about the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, like don't pursue those things, where well, the enemy's constantly whispering those things to us. But through Christ, we have the power to resist the devil and he'll flee from you. We have the ability to say no to the things of this world, the enemy, the spirit of deception, and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, it's really important for us to do that because I think what happens is if we turn a blind eye to the spiritual realm, you know, that's there. I mean, Ephesians is clear. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. That's another text that helps see that. Right. But against the principalities of the air and the spirit of darkness, right? Like, so we, we know that's the war that wages there and, and we've got to be aware of how that war works and what the enemy will do. And, and you know, I think it allows us to be vigilant to say, man, we need to be in a, a good, healthy local church. Right. We need believers around us, Hebrews 3, Hebrews 10, and we need to pray like crazy for the power and protection of God. And then when we see or sense things like that, I think we, we can declare in Jesus' name freedom from those things. And uh, man, we, we want to be working to that end so the enemy doesn't have a foothold. And so when we just are dismissive, kind of like how you grew up, I grew up, um, it's a really dangerous place to be. Yeah. Well, thank you for, for answering that, that tough question. Like, like you said before, maybe we'll do a whole series on it at some point. I know that we can go into a bunch of different areas. So if you're listening or you're, or you're watching and you have more questions about that, please feel free to email those to us, Pastor Mike at Image ATL. While you're taking a look and, and thinking if you have questions, if you wouldn't mind subscribing to our YouTube channel or following us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, that helps us out a lot. Leave us a thumbs up and a like on any of those platforms. It really helps us a lot. But Pastor Mike, shifting back to kind of a, a less intense question, one of the questions that came up was, um, what is uh, your stance on kind of vocation and particularly for those who um, work in, outside of a, a local church context and even within, how can we, what principles can we apply to glorify God in our jobs? Yeah, that's really good. Uh, I think Colossians 3 gives a great framework for this, um, that whatever your hands find to do, work at it with all your heart is this working unto the Lord, not unto man. And so when we see work prescribed, we see work is a means of worship. And I think this goes very back to the beginning of creation. When God created Adam and Eve, pre-fall, work was given, cultivate the garden. So work is not a bad thing. Work is a good thing that God's given. And so when we work well, 
um, we're actually actually worshiping God in our work. And so I think that it's a very foundation. We've got to understand work is a way of worship. And so that means how we work is important. And it means that our boss is not our ultimate ends. God is, which means that he governs our perspective on work. So that means uh, we want to be men and women of character. That means that we want to be um, uh, moral and ethical at our jobs. Um, that means that, that we have a different standard that we work to. We're not going to cut corners or trim edges. Like, and, and, you know, I think one of the things I've always pushed against is there's this mentality, and especially you see this in the sports world, like where, you know, Christians are softer and squishier because like, oh, we want to be. And it's like, no, no, no. If you're really a Christ follower and you understand work is worship, then, man, you want to be the best at your job. You want to be the best at your sport because in that you want to bring God glory, which also means that in your successes that you're very quick to leverage those successes for Christ and not for yourself. And I think this is where it's important, too, where you realize the back end of, man, diligent work under the Lord and the blessings that come from that, they, they are from God, and they're to be you know <laughs> distributed back to God in the way that we talk about them and the way that we express those things. And so I think at its very foundational level, we've got to understand that capacity, which means um, also that our job is our mission field. And we can't miss that. God has called you. He's gifted you with, you know, when it comes to vocation, one of the things I, I talk with people a lot about is like, what do you like to do? What are you good at? What do people affirm in you? And so where, wherever those three things collide and, and leads to the career that you're in, you're at that career using the gifts God's given you. But the purpose of those gifts, right, is to worship God. One of the greatest ways to worship God is by telling others about who God is. And so um, that's another thing is that you're a missionary in your workplace. And yeah. so um, th- those are a couple things that I would say as it relates to vocation, just off the jump. Yeah, I think, um, you know, we think about lev- like what you said about sports players. You know, I think I've, all of us have seen a, a sports player get up there at the podium and say, you know, Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior or or in Philippians 413. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Philippians 413. Or like or it'll come out like a player is super successful and, and finally it'll come out like, oh, th- they call themselves a Christian. And all this stuff, and I think for for me, like I think about you know working a corporate job, um, it's like well I don't I don't get a podium to to stand up, and so that makes me think well what are the ways in which I can I can give the the shout out to Jesus so to speak, and I think one of the biggest ways that, that comes to mind is, is generosity when it comes to like the money you make is in a lot of ways you know not millions of dollars for a professional football player or baseball player. But it is a way that you can then give back the way you give and then also being a missionary. But how do you do you have principles for approaching those conversations um, in everyday workplaces? Yeah, as far as the employee or are you talking yeah, about? Yeah, like like I, I think about like you when you whenever you tell me about like your experiences with people at the gym, like that's a secular environment. And um, like I think people get weirded out about like, man, especially in 2023, how do I talk to my coworkers in a on a Zoom call about Jesus? Uh, you got any principles there for, for being able to do that? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it with jobs, what's great is it's high relational for the most part. And so a lot of times the the lead into you talking about Christ is how you live your life. And, I mean, you see this, you know, in Scripture, too, about this call to godly living. You see this in Titus as well, about being about marketplace ministry. And that marketplace ministry is like be, just be excellent at your job and do things the ethical right way. We live in a culture that's depraved and that likes to cut corners and short things out and to try to do anything at any means possible to have success and to beat the next person out, whatever it is. I think the way that you go about your job, the ethic that you work with, the character that's there, it's going to cause people to ask questions about your life. And then when they ask those questions, you're able to share them. Or if there's an opportunity in the midst of these relational spaces where somebody talks about something in their own life that, you know, brokenness they're experiencing. Brokenness is the number one bridge to the gospel, in my opinion. Anytime somebody talks about brokenness, it is an insert gospel immediately, you know, Uh, not just like Jesus, but it's like helping them see like, man, I know that like this world is hard and it's full of brokenness. Like what you're experiencing is evidence of such a bigger problem. But where my hope is, is through Christ. Like, man, what do you think about Jesus? Have you heard anything? Do you understand how he even fits into all this? There's so many ways to segue into that through through brokenness. Yeah. Um, I think another way is the parameters you set up in your job. Hmm. I think parameters as it relates to how much time you give to your job, you know, cutting off things, hard stops to say, man, I can't make that meeting um, because I've got community group or I've got my gathering or I've got a men's group tonight or, or whatever it is. Um, the thing is, is that, man, there are people that are not Christians that claim like religious liberty to miss things all the time. 
And I don't know what it is with Christians, but they're scared to death to like draw a line and say like, hey, my faith is important to me, and so I have some things in this life that I want to do, and they're going to take priority for me. Um, I think even in the in the onboarding process, you're sharing that with your boss, saying, hey, there's a few things, and I want to figure out I'm willing to do whatever else if it means giving or taking here, but these are some priorities in my life. So I think the time parameters. I also think the um, participation parameters, so what your, um, uh, your job and your company choose to do and where they choose to go. Um, you saying yes and no based off of, you know, the Christian ethic and, and where you feel morally comfortable. If they're going to go to a place that's, you know, inappropriate and and you're like, man, I'm you know, I'm going to hang back and, you know, or it's going to be just a, a party that's unhelpful. I'm all for like being at parties. Jesus was. But it, there's also lines that get crossed a lot of times and there's spaces yeah. that, you know, we know those that we could parse yeah, just them out, be wise. Yeah. Be wise in that where you where you choose to participate in. And I think that speaks, and people are like, man, what's up? You know, why are you, you know, you don't cut corners here. You don't, people will know. I mean, it, Scripture is clear on this. People will know you by the fruit that you produce, and they will ask questions. And that's why Peter says to be ready to give an answer right. when people come and ask. Yeah, that's good. Um, we're almost at time. One just fun one to, to kind of close it out here, um, especially in Atlanta. We spend a lot of time in the car. Maybe not if you, you're like me and you have a remote job a lot of times, but many people do spend a lot of time commuting to work. What do you, is, do we, are we, is it over spiritualizing to say we should, we should steward that time well as well. And, uh, I don't think it is by the way. I don't think you do either. How, what are some suggestions for that time? Yeah, no, I think it's a great time. Um, you're in the car, you're in the commute. Why not leverage it? Why not redeem the time? Uh, make most of it. You know, Paul talks about that. And so um, I think a couple ways to do that. One, um, you know, I would encourage people, especially the, the audible learners, I mean, you can have your time in the Word there. I mean, listening to, I, I use the Dwell app and uh, I, I don't speed it up like I'm reading a book or, or whatever, but I just, I'm able to, especially Old Testament narrative, I really enjoy. I'm in Second Chronicles right now. I really enjoy listening to it. I'm able to digest it more. I can go back and listen to things. It's really easy. Um, access there. So I think time of the word prayer is another one, taking time to pray and and really leverage in that time. I think again, we have over spiritualized what time in the word looks like. Like the goal is saturating your mind and heart with it. How you do that and where you do that is up to you. Um, we now have cars and so there's the ability to listen to things. And so I think that's a great one. I would start there. If you have a natural rhythm of time in the word elsewhere, then potentially listening to a podcast like this one or others that can help you learn what it means to follow Jesus. Um, you know, I think there's some ways if you want to use it as some hobby time, uh, because again, you have other rhythms in your life, that's fine. I'm not saying you force you into a specific box, but I do think it's, man, it's a, a really good opportunity that you should ask the question, man, am I leveraging this time to the best ability that I possibly can for the sake of my spiritual health and growth? Um, you know, is, what does that look like for me? Yeah. I'll add one more that you didn't mention. And that is like uh, phone call check-ins. Yeah. Um, you know, that's, that's dead time where you, we do have phones that we can talk to each other and it doesn't always have to be though preferable face to face um, phone call check-ins while you're on your commute. Well, you can FaceTime now too. If yeah, you I, be well, I don't know if that's safe or legal, you I know, know. If I FaceTime I know. while driving, but, uh, but yeah, you, you can use that time to check in with people, have a conversation, um, even pray with other people. I think that that's perfectly yeah. use of that time anyway, but as more questions come, I know you love these episodes where we get to talk about them. And so for anyone watching or listening, you can send those to us at pastor Mike at image ATL.com email those to us, or I think you can leave a comment on the YouTube video with a question. We'd love to answer those. And with that being said, we release these podcasts every Friday or not every Friday morning, every other Friday morning, we used to be every week. And so we'll be on the lookout for that in a couple of weeks. Pastor Mike, thank you for your awesome. time as always. Yeah, thank you. Awesome.